Welcome to Orthopod, a podcast about the people of orthopedics and their stories. We understand that we all play many roles in our careers and lives, and it is these very stories that ultimately inform our successes and failures. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Orthopod. My name is Mo Bendari. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Ortho Evidence, and I get a chance to interact today with the principal investigator of a uh, you know, pretty impressive, uh, well-conducted, randomized clinical trial. We have a, a Professor Carlos Segura, who is the chair of orthopedic surgery uh, at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida. And let me just say, if I could, that this paper was published fairly recently. It was published in 2021, in March of 2021. And it focused specifically on how we can improve complications Uh, And and you'll you'll hear a little bit more about the details uh, around uh, wound complications, particularly following uh, revision total knee arthroplasty. We are very lucky to have uh, Carlos here as the principal investigator. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us. And I wonder if you could share just what was, from your perspective, the reason that you even got into this area of research and how this particular study uh, has changed your practice or uh, just in general, your your views on the issue of uh, managing complications. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Bandari, for uh, the invitation and, and spending time uh, with me and highlighted this uh, study. Uh, well, the, the reason we started to look into this is because, uh, as you know, we all have this high-risk patients that uh, a lot of times, despite the fact that we put all our best effort on um, doing a good job, doing the revisions and so forth, they still uh, develop a significant amount of complications. And, and probably the, the most common complication related to the surgery, not medical complication, but surgical complication is the surgical side complications that unfortunately, a lot of times they will lead to infection and reoperations. And you already know how costly and how impactful those things are for the uh, patients. So, uh, we learn about the um, close incision negative pressure therapy has been around, uh, started uh, with trauma and has been uh, slowly uh, migrating to other uh, service line, general surgery, and now elective orthopedics. And um, we, sorry about that. No worries. Um, so we, we did a pilot study in uh at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, evaluating this again in high-risk patients that underwent uh, revision, uh, total hip and total knee arthroplasty, and we found that there was a significant decrease in the surgical side complications and even uh, infections and reoperations. And that was really what led to do this study. That was just one uh, single cohort. It was relatively small, and it was combining hip and knee. So we wanted to do kind of a more pure study. Uh, obviously, this require a multi-center perspective, randomized, and try to uh, collect big numbers. And, and that's how we started. Um, and, and basically what we did was to compare um, this closed incisional uh, therapy versus standard of care, which nowadays, the majority of the time, they are using a silver impregnated uh, uh, dressing we wanted to uh, leave the quote unquote uh, therapy for at least five days of negative pressure. And then uh, our main outcome was to look at the um, incidence of surgical site complications during the first 90 days of the procedure. And the important thing here is to understand that we only included uh, revisions, total knees, on high-risk patients. What what doesn't mean high-risk patients? Well, morbidly obese, patients that are in uh, in, um, anticoagulants, patients that are immunosuppressed, either uh, they're taking medication or they have rheumatoid arthritis, patients that have malnutrition, liver disease, status of uh, organ transplantation, smokers, uncontrolled diabetes, those more or less encompass the, the group of patients that we look at and then we randomized them, again, prospectively, um, almost 10 different sites. So I don't want to take all the credit. This is really uh, a teamwork. Uh, and then we followed them for about 90 days. 
And um, what we found out, the, the main finding was at 90 days, the, the rate of surgical site complication in the study group was about 3.4%, whereas in the control group was uh, about 14%. And when we look at the different type of complications, including any, any surgical site infection, superficial infection, deep infection, uh, wound dehiscency, seroma, skin necrosis, continued drainage, uh, in every single one of those categories, uh, the rate was higher in the control group than the study group. Not of, in some instances, not statistically significant, but we clearly, when we combine them all, it was uh, statistically significant. It was a big difference. Uh, we also look at uh, other outcomes, like uh, we wanted to be sure that the dressing was not impairing um, like function of patient, for example. We also wanted to see if there was an effect in pain. So we look at who scores uh, and we look at promise uh, scores. And despite the fact there was a slight uh, better uh, trend on the study group, it was not statistically significant. Basically, both groups had improvement in, in pain and function overall outcomes. Um, and then the other thing that was important is, is the, the amount of dressing changes, uh, which can have some, some financial implications. So in the, in the study group, we have way less number of uh, dressing changes, um, almost a third uh, decrease compared to the control group. And this was statistically significant as well. Now, when we look at the reoperations and um, there was no statistically uh, significant difference. However, um, it was less, it, it, the, the amount of, of uh, readmissions on the study group was about 3.4% and the uh, control group was about 10%. And then finally, reoperations, despite the fact, again, that it was, it was a difference, it was not statistically significant. It was about 2.7% in the um, control group and only 0.7% on the study group. So those were the main findings of the study. Um, we did an interim analysis uh, and we stopped the study because we found a clear difference in the, in the study group. So it was not ethically, um, uh, appropriate to continue with the study. So we, we stop early, but, but they, as, as I just described to you, we have enough power to, to find differences. Do you uh, think so? Now, first, hold on, go ahead. No, but probably the last thing I, I would like to mention is, is the cost, right? Because that's always, in, in this current environment, we always uh, have to ensure that these new technologies are truly cost effective. And um, one of the problems that we were having in the past before we use this particular device, um, I really want to leave commercial names aside, but it's basically a portable, very affordable device compared to just doing a, a regular incision or back dressing was that at least here in the U.S. Or, or at least here in Florida, we usually needed to wait for the insurance company to approve the device, the machine, so the patient can go home with the with the with the machine, and that usually took one to two days to get approval. And as you can imagine, the length of stay was longer. And then when we look at the cost benefit, not to mention the opportunity cost of having another patient in that bed, uh, it, it pay it pay the cost. Not to that's putting aside the readmissions, reoperations, the cost of treatment of the of the wound complications. That that was actually a big driver here in my hospital. You know, sometimes when we're dealing with the administrators, we really have to show these things. Otherwise we won't be able to access uh, these technologies. You know, and it's so true. First of all, thank you very much. That's a really clear summary and uh, of an important study. You know, it's funny because, you know, we've done our groups done trials for some decades as well. And I have always been surprised that we will find, um, you know, major, major issues and complications, like differences between one treatment and another. But we, um, when we do functional assessments and quality of life, we they just haven't been sensitive, sensitive enough to pick up even differences in reoperation rates. We found so not too surprising to me that you didn't see a big difference in some of the functional outcomes. Um, it doesn't in any way, in my mind, negate the importance, um, you know, of major practice change associated with uh, considering, you know, novel therapies. The thing that I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm interested in is when you uh, 
you know, you said that you were trending towards potential, um, you know, it looked like positive effects in, in terms of readmission rates. You know, you were, you were close and certainly, uh, and even reoperations, you know, potentially with power issues. Do you think if you had recruited the whole sample size for, for the other reasons that you might have even hit some of those metrics? The challenge always is, right, you're, you're balancing patient safety with numbers. Everything here seems to be trending because you were seeing some massive reductions in risk. I mean, I think the number I pulled was an 80% reduction in the risk of, um, of, a, of, of a surgical site complication. It's pretty dramatic. And I can see why there would have been concern around you know, c- continuing the study. And, I, and you were trending in the same directions and pretty well most of the other metrics. I always wonder you know, if, you know, if, if, if a study of 400, 500 patients conducted, whether you wouldn't have even hit those metrics. Do you ever, when you look back at early discontinuation, wonder about some fact of whether you might've hit significance on some of the other major outcomes that you are just short on? Yeah. So we found a, a significant, a statistically significant difference in the readmission. So okay. it was almost, you know, 3% versus yeah. you know, 0.7%. So, so that was statistically significant. The reoperation uh, as you mentioned, it was definitely a trend. Uh, it was not statistically significant, but uh, it, it, that was a, a, a difficult pill to swallow because we were just thinking, well, I mean, we really know these patients are, we are, we can prevent some of those reoperations, but is it worth to continue and then put these patients at risk? And it, oh, yeah. it, it was hard, you know, to say, let's do it, but we saw such a, as you just mentioned, such a dramatic uh, change yeah. that we said, now it, it, I think that we should, we should uh, stop. Now, if you look at some of the other evidence and this kind of help, uh, you know, this was um, sponsored by industry. So for them, of course, they wanted to continue. They wanted to get as much as they could out of the study. But sure. one of the things that we talk about was like, look, um, there's already plenty of evidence out there that shows that you can decrease reoperation. So I think that that concept is, is, is out there. Yeah. And, and then at the end, we, I think that we did what is right for the patient and we stopped. No, absolutely. I, I think ultimately patient care, you know, everything's centered around evidence-based practice. Let me ask you also, Carlos, if I could, from the perspective of, of some of the cost metrics, are you, I mean, is there a plan or, or has there been work done on doing a cost modeling related to this trial? Because clearly you've yeah. got a number of metrics. Is that a, a, a study or a potential analysis yeah, yeah. that's so coming? Actually, uh, so one of the co-authors of this study uh, in Columbia, Dr. John Cooper, uh, he actually just presented uh, this at ACAS uh, as an yep. abstract. So okay. I think that he is, uh, that paper is either, or oh, has been, is going to be submitted. Or no, sure. Reviewed. Okay. So it's coming. It's coming. Good. It's yeah. Because people yes. want that. People yeah. will definitely want that. Because the power with these studies is anytime there is a, uh, you know, we, we'll say a, a novel treatment or, or it's, a, you know, a, 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 an intervention that's suggesting a major, major effect that has incremental costs associated with the benefit has to be modeled out. And it sounds like, I mean, you've already done that, what I would say mental calculus to say, listen, this is going to be cost effective in many ways because of the cost of an infection is massive, right? The cost of a complication is massive and, uh, and, and wound and wound problems are, are highly problematic in this fairly complex po- patient population. So I, I'm just, I think for, for readers and viewers, it'll be great to have that data out as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that that's coming. Um, you know, I can tell here in my hospital, um, I was able just to that particular group of patients that underwent revisions that, that were like, quote unquote, high risk. Yeah. Um, we showed that since we started to use the technology, we decreased the length of stay to oh, there you uh, go. control. So, yeah. it, it, you know, at the beginning, they were really trying to hold me accountable for, for the <laughs> mental cost of this, but I showed them, look, I mean, I decreased the length of stay. So this was, this was what we were promising. And since then, they kind of, um, let me use it with, with no restriction. You know, and, and this gets to a broader question, you know, and it's maybe two questions I have for you that I think, I think many people probably wonder about and often struggle with, right? They have, they have a, uh, an idea, a product and or a technology that they believe works. And then they go and say, we, uh, we want to bring it into our hospital. I mean, I'm, I'm sure in this, in, in this particular case, the Cleveland Clinic has a very, you know, pretty stringent policies about what you're bringing in and, 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 and you know, what's the evidence behind it. Can you speak a little bit to, you know, those surgeons, you know, who work in the, you know, in, all across, you know, the nation and communities 
who are saying, okay, I need to bring in some novel technology. And, and let's say in this particular case, it is, you know, um, um, a, a, a closed incision, you know, negative pressure therapy is that, that was used here. How, how hard has it been negotiating with administration? Um, and what are the tactics you have to use with administration to bring in, uh, you know, new treatments? And clearly you went ahead and did a full trial. Not everyone's gonna do that. Um, but what are some of the tactics and some of the approaches that that you found helpful in interacting with administration around new technologies? Well, one of the things that I have learned in, in this job is that you, know, you, have to, you have to talk the same language that they do. You know, yeah. Obviously, uh, one way or another, all of us, what this is about is providing good patient care. However, we are all being assessed differently. And, and uh, obviously, the administrators have to respond for a budget and EBITDA. So money is always an issue. Um, but another thing that plays a significant role is, is some of the quality metrics, right? So readmissions, reoperations, all these uh, uh, complications. And depending on who is paying, some of the private payers now are starting collecting actually more um, uh, m- uh, minuted uh, data, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like surgical site complications, yeah. uh, wound dehiscency, and, and those type of things. So when you present a solution that has uh, definitely an, an easy way to understand of decreased cost or similar and improve your quality metrics, I, I think that that's actually what they're looking for. So the problem with what we have with a lot of the new technologies is, is it is hard to find those two elements because the majority of the time it's going to cost you more money. It's not cost neutral. And, and it is hard to find a metric that is significant. You know, a lot of times, you know, you see, like for example, robotics is, is yeah, a good it's a big one, one. I'm dealing with, right? Oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. I really have to find something meaningful to justify its use. And you know, we can spend another hour talking <laughs> well, about that well, here. Actually, I'm thinking, I'm really, uh, I really believe that there is a significant need of a non-industry sponsor prospective randomized trial yeah you know what we're working on that that's a great 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 idea and since we just since you brought that up you know at ortho evidence we have the same challenge right because you know we we just put out a review on this particular topic and the challenge with it is is your point i think so much has been invested on futures you know the future is you know where robotics you know um, you know has a real play and we can see that you know people can want to believe it but when you actually look at the data today um, it's not quite as compelling as what the future hope is, you know, and that's where this disconnect is, um, where people are hoping, well, you have to start somewhere. Um, but it would be wonderful to have, uh, you know, thoughtful, um, you know, thoughtful evaluation of this that isn't directly uh, focused on, um, you know, and, and it, you know, isn't directly focused on, I guess, metrics that don't necessarily lead to better outcomes. There are metrics yeah. that might show, you know, and, and we know this all the time. This particular study, though, the promise of study, uh, pretty compelling. Um, and, and maybe on my last question to you, Carlos, if I could ask, is, you know, you started off very appropriately uh, and very thoughtfully about using a real population at risk. And you were very uh, clear and deliberate about that, I'm sure. Knowing what you're knowing and as you're using it more and more, let's say, do you feel that the indications would be expanded to you know a broader spectrum? Because if the treatment effect is conserved, you know, an 80% reduction in risk in a high risk should theoretically still have an 80% reduction in risk in a lower risk. And the question is, how low risk do you go? And does it go from only the high complication revision to all revision? I guess that's kind of the question that maybe. You may not have an answer to it, but I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah, and, and that, that, that's a great question. I and mean, this, this is why we, I, I get this all the time, like why not use it on everybody? And I think that we have to be very cautious. And, and this is one of the things that people have to learn. I try to tell my fellows and my residents, look, the devil is in the details and you have to look at the details of the paper. You know, it's not just to say, okay, we know negative pressure is great, has benefits, do we have to use it on everybody? I would probably say no. Um, and then, so doctor, uh, the, the group at Rush actually just did uh, a prospective randomized trial on all comers, okay. uh, and they found that there is no difference. Okay. There's no difference. So that, that again, uh, however, that doesn't mean it's not a good technology. Absolutely. Because that, it depends how you use the, those findings. 
I think that we have great technology. The problems that we a lot of times fall into is that we say, oh, well, it's all or nothing. And that's not the truth. I mean, and in medicine, you will see that all the time. All the patients are different. And certain technologies that despite the fact that can be more expensive, they may be very good for those type of patients. And I think that that's those that have this problem all the time with the payers, you know, denials and things like that is because they try to do all or nothing. And they don't understand that the devil is in the details. And I think that that those are the more open conversations that we need to to start having. And if I may, Dr. Mandela, like for mm. example, when we say, okay, closed sensational therapy, you know, is, is not, that doesn't mean that all the products are the same. So we have to, you know, that's another issue because I won't be surprised if someone else tried to resemble the, sim, the similar study, maybe with a different product, a different technology that have a different learning curve and so forth, and they may not have the same results. So you have to be also cautious about that. Like a lot of times we, we just say, well, it's this type of technology, despite the fact that they may be different products. And we know that a Ferrari uh, is not the same that as a Honda Civic, despite the mm-hmm. fact that both are cars, mm-hmm. they're very different cars. And Absolutely. you have to be very cautious about that. No, I think you're right. I mean, uh, I know you were very careful just to talk about, you know, the idea of a, um, you know, of a closed incision negative pressure therapy. Would you mind, though, just disclosing which was the product used in this particular trial for those who might be interested in learning more about the individual product, but also uh, reading the paper? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in the paper. Is is a Provena? Provena, um, okay. Uh, KCI originally, and now that's a 3M company. Okay. Um, Okay, no, I appreciate that. Okay, good. I mean, it's important to know because, I mean, like, you know, there are some pretty profound uh, study findings. I can't thank you enough. And I think these sorts of small um, interactions that go along with the paper publication on ortho evidence, for example, are really, really helpful because, you know, we don't always get a chance to hear from the principal investigator, but more importantly, um, when we get a chance to hear from someone who's thought about this, uh, who's obviously deeply invested in the care of patients like yourself, um, it means that much more to our uh, members, our readership, and certainly our viewers. So um, I can't thank you enough for taking a bit of time and really appreciate all you're doing for orthopedic scholarship and obviously the care of patients worldwide. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos Guerra, uh, Chair of the Orthopedic, uh, of orthopedic Surgery in the Department of Orthopedics at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida.